So uh, Ricky's on here, of course, as well. Uh, hey, Ricky, how are you? Good. Well, uh, we want to take a second and talk about kind of where we've come as a community over the, over the course of the last year. And then we're going to talk about the specific changes that we've made in the, in the course and kind of what that means for you going forward. Overall, I think you're going to leave this, uh, this webinar feeling like a lot of the changes are fairly subtle in terms of the tactic, but I think you'll also see that the, the result that you're going to yield will be very different than before. Um, because small changes to what we do, going for a more competitive topic, for example, uh, can mean a very different result in terms of how much traffic it actually means for you. So, uh, Ricky, we, one thing that we are always watching, uh, like a hawk, is how people are how people are doing it actually succeeding at income school. Can you give us some of those cool numbers? Yeah, it's pretty sweet. So, in the last year, in the last twelve months, um, fifty-two of you guys have gone full-time with blogging or at least reached a full-time income and reported that number to us. That's just, duh, that's why we wake up in the morning. That's, that's why Jim and I do what we do. Two families, that's a neighborhood of people making yeah. their, their full-time income from doing this. And so it's working and we're really excited for those that it's working for. But we're also extremely focused on those of you who are getting there, uh, that that's uh, it's still a yeah. destination. And we think this is going to make that better. And I mean, along those lines, 135 of you guys have hit $1,000 a month and 173 have hit $500 a month in the last year. And those earlier milestones, like when you hit those, it, you start getting those results. I mean, it, it just getting from there to full time is easier than getting from zero to 500 or I would even say zero to a hundred. I totally agree. I was going to say the same thing. <laughs> zero to a hundred. That's way harder oh, than a hundred to full time in my, in my opinion. Yep. Totally. Okay. So we've done some really cool things. Also just in the course material, it's changed drastically over the last year. We've made tons of updates to Akabato. We launched our YouTube course and then uh, updated it with a completely new version of it. Uh, we added the Patreon course. We did Ultimate Content Warriors. We did the 10, 10 day info product course, which was a major launch for us. That 10 day info products course, there is years of work put into that uh, learning how to sell well to cold traffic. So that's one I'm, we're really excited about. Plus our monetization course and working with ads providers of how we can improve the process to get those of you who are brand new to get signed up for ads. So we've changed dramatically as a community and we're seeing it in the results now. Um, uh, we've had so many people go full time and the pace is just increasing. I mean, it's maybe more than one a week now that we're seeing going full time. It's really an exciting time to be doing this. And so it, it kind of makes me think like looking back now a year or two, how many people did we see post in the community or elsewhere and just say like, I give up, blogging is dying, whatever. And it's like, okay, but the pace of people succeeding is getting faster and faster. Um, and there are more people as well, but like, cool things are happening for us as bloggers and we're excited to, to take advantage of them. Sure. Okay. I think we got to get into that then. What, what, I mean, things that are changing for bloggers and I totally think that now is as good a time, if not a better time than ever to be getting into blogging. Um, some of these changes that we're going to talk about over the next little bit here come from changes to Google. And now, I mean, say what you will about Google, say what you will about some of their changes. Certainly a lot of them, I mean, probably all of them are intended to help their business improve, but because of the improvements they're making to the search, the, you know, their AI, just what they're able to do in terms of search, it's actually opening doors for the type of content that we've been promoting all along. And so I'm, that's why I feel like it's as good a time, if not a better time than ever, is because Google's doing a really good job of just sifting through the crumb, the, just the, the garbage content and finding the good stuff. And so I think this is just a huge opportunity for us at this time. Let's dive in, let's get to the new stuff. So we're gonna go step-by-step step on all the major changes 
But um, again, it's about the implementation of the small things that I think is actually going to give you the bigger result than what we're going to talk about. Okay, the first one that we want to talk about is one that uh, we've kind of missed over as we've talked about this before. So there's a new search analysis tool. Um, we, it's just in the Excel sheet. You all had the, ver the first version of the search analysis tool, and it was real simple, you know, do your brand plan, etc. Well, we sat down to do search analysis on a site, uh, whew, I don't know, three, four months ago. And we sat down and did it and we said, hey, should we do this step? And one of us, I can't even remember who said, nah, it's okay, we'll just skip that. And we all said, wait a minute, if we're not doing that step, why is it that we're teaching? Um, and we realized some things had changed and we needed to adapt the process to make it. So you'll find the new search analysis tool is way more streamlined. You'll be able to do things quicker in it. But the coolest thing that it does is you're entering your ideas it walks you through the validation of those ideas. See, it's gonna check how much traffic and how much competition it has on that Excel sheet. And then when you enter the competition and uh, search volume for any query, it's gonna automatically spit out, should you do a response post, staple post, how many hours should you spend on it? And I think the most important is the priority of that post. So it used to be that we just said, write all your response posts, then write all your staple posts, then write all your pillar posts. Now we're changing that. Now we're seeing based on the competition and the search volume, which are the low hanging fruit, the high priority, medium, low priority. And then we also have a category that's like, should you even write this? Maybe. Uh, like if you're out of ideas or you really just have a hunch on this one, fine. And then we also have a category that just says, no, just don't write it. <laughs> just don't even do it. And so I really think that that's going to make us better um, to get quicker results for the new people and for the advanced people by going off the priority of the post instead of the more uh, rudimentary just response than staple than pillar. I think this is a smarter way to go about, about it. When you see how the tool works, I think you're going to say, oh yeah, that's, it's just a better way to organize how we roll out content. And again, that's wherever you are in the process, even if your site's more advanced, I think I'd still do the same organization because it's still going to help you get those early rankings as you move on to even more competitive things. Absolutely. Some other, some changes that you're going to see as you start going through the course, you're going to find that there's no pillar posts anywhere. And, you know, a, a huge driver for that is the distinction between pillar posts and staple posts was fairly artificial. In fact, it was pretty much just the length of the post. Um, and really, we're also seeing shifts in user behavior. We're seeing people, I mean, nobody's spending that long reading a blog post almost ever anymore. And so, again, why are we writing so much content, especially because of shifts that we're seeing now in Google that, that suggest that it's, there's not such a strong correlation anymore to blog post length versus ranking, as there used to be. Um, and frankly, there was. There was a pretty strong correlation. Um, but we're just seeing that totally change as Google gets, gets better and better and better at differentiating between good content and fluff. Um, and so you're seeing that staple posts are disappearing. So now there's really just two main post types, response and staple. But you'll see that we've also got a lot of kind of different approaches to staple posts. Um, and, and there really is a, a distinction between a response and a staple post. And, and just to cut in, so the response post is a thousand words, staple yeah. post is 2000 words plus. Plus, right. And so again, like we've shortened the response post length to a thousand words. And the staple post length is 2000 plus. So we're not saying never write a long post, but we are definitely saying that there's not a wrong distinction between staple and pillar posts. So let's treat them as similar, but now let's just figure out, you know, the right mix and the right types of posts for each individual, individual topic. Um, so you're going to see some differences there. Yeah, so it, as you're doing the search analysis, as you go through the tool, the comment that I've seen several times today is, hey, something's wrong with the new search analysis tool. And to be clear, the search analysis tool, it's that Google sheet that we're going to link you to. It's in the first lesson in the new blogging course. Just go to the blogging course, 
when you get to the first lesson on search analysis, you'll see at the bottom right, it, we link to it right there. When you get to that tool, don't download it and don't click request for access. Just go on it and go to file duplicate in Google Sheets and then you'll have your own Google Sheet that you can go make all your edits to everything. But keep it in Google Sheets because then it's, you know, it's on the cloud, it's available, et cetera, and it won't mess up the formatting if you just downloaded it to Excel. Uh, as a side note, our new service contentwarrior.com, all you do is link us to your Google Sheet of your search analysis and we get on writing it. You no need to type in all your articles in this email back and forth, everything like that. Okay, but the comment that I heard actually a couple times today is, hey, I think something's broken on this search analysis tool because it's recommending that I'm writing like mostly staple posts with only some response posts. And that's exactly by design. Um, we're intending to focus much more on the staple post and less on the response post. And the clear reason for this is with the new search analysis process, we're able to better identify topics that have search volume. And because we know they have search volume more reliably, we wanna put everything we got into that article and make the best resource possible. It used to be a lot of spray and pray, and we've owned up to that, that really that was a big piece of the technique. You know, we're using autofill, we're taking everything we got, and it's like, hey, it doesn't, it takes me 90 minutes to write a response post, and I'll just chuck some stuff up. Well, now we're focused instead on how do we get things that we know have that search volume and then create an amazing resource that's worth that effort on time. This kind of goes back to a YouTube video that we did a while ago where we did our own comparison on our own sites of response staple and pillar posts. And we saw how much traffic on average did the pillar post get compared to the staple compared to the response post. And we saw the pillar posts got the most traffic per post. And so that's what is leading some people right now to saying like, what in the world? Then why would you kill the pillar post if that's the one that on average is getting the most? Because we, we did the analysis a little bit further. And then we said, how about how many hours we spend on a post compared to how much traffic it brought in? And when you put that into the equation, what we actually saw is even though the pillar post brought the most, it was taking so long to write those posts that we were getting a lower of in lower return on our time. And so that's a major reason why we're moving away from the pillar post in addition to other factors that we've mentioned um, is, and so now we really feel like the return on time, the sweet spot is gonna be the staple post with the new search analysis system. Exactly. Now, um, one thing I wanna make pretty clear, with the new system, we're, you know, we're talking about eliminating staple posts. We're talking about reducing the minimum word counts. Sorry, None of the, eliminating pillar, right? No, yes, I'm sorry, eliminating pillar. Thank you for correcting, because someone's gonna be like, whoa, wait, now it's only staple. No, uh, eliminating pillar posts, reducing the minimum word counts for these articles. None of this is intended to save time. It's not intended to make it faster to go write a response post. It's intended to encourage more compact writing, which is really important. Um, we don't, fluff should basically not exist in our blog posts anymore. Every sentence in the post should have a purpose. That doesn't mean there shouldn't be personality. It means that every sentence that you write should have a purpose. It should have a point in the blog post um, and, and should add to the user's experience and to the content, the information that they're getting from you. It's also to encourage additional um, actual original research. We're finding that, you know, con the content that is of high value is the content that is not getting hit by these algorithm updates. Google is just doing a better and better and better job at sifting through all of the garbage and finding the good stuff. And so that's the point here. We're actually, we actually set time recommendations. These, these are the timings that we use for our own in-house writers. A response post of a thousand words, we still, they spend two hours writing it, even though they used to spend two hours writing a 1,350 word post. Now they spend two hours on even less writing and it's because it actually is a little bit harder to write more concisely and better. And then same thing with those staple posts, we're saying, you know, spend three, four or five hours on a post. As a beginner, 
that that might not be realistic. It might take you much longer, but those are recommended times that I'd love to see people work toward being able right. to do. And you should be close, even as a beginner. I mean, our, our content warrior team, we just hired a big batch of people. I think we added 20 new people in addition to our 30 people who are experienced. And, you know, they've only been at it for a few weeks now. They're hitting their times. I, I mean, when we give them a time of, hey, this is a three to four hour staple post, they are getting there and they're getting precisely the same videos that you're getting in Project 24 to be trained. And so um, if you're finding that you're going way over the times consistently, something is wrong. And uh, we need to just kind of look at a timer and really kind of work at it. It's not that you have to like, ah, four hours, hands off. You know, it's not like, a, it's not like you're taking the SAT, right? But at the same time, it's about return on your time that you spend writing those posts. And so it is important to do. Yep. Should we All dive right. into search analysis? Yeah, let's do it. Okay. <laughs> oh boy, this is a big one. So what we're doing in the new process for search analysis is we're opening up to some usage of tools to identify search volume. Now we're going to talk about commercial tools. We'll mention Ahrefs in a minute. But first, let's talk about tools that are publicly available to everyone. We've gone through an exhaustive, exhaustive search on every tool that possibly purports to know the search volume for a particular term and tested against our own data, looking at dozens of different blogs, posts that we know how much traffic they brought in and comparing that to the tools. And ah, it just drives us nuts, right? Um, that we say, ah, none of this is right. But there is one tool publicly available that we found a unique way to use that we haven't seen anyone else use this way that uh, is showing a lot of promise for us. And as we've compared it to our own data on these websites has been incredibly valuable at estimating that search volume. I'm gonna share my screen and show you exactly how that works. Now, this is a very high level look at how this works, please watch the course content and you'll you'll understand much more of this. So I'm gonna to go to uh, just Google and I'm gonna search for best webcams, okay? Now, when we come here, we have no idea how many people are searching this every month, not that helpful. So now let's go to trends.google.com and there's a little Easter egg that we found in Google Trends that made a big difference. Now I'm gonna search best webcams. Now. Not surprisingly, we have a dashboard of data. You've all seen Google Trends before. All of these boxes have information in them. And so we say, okay, well, this actually doesn't tell us anything about search volume. This scale over here is not saying, you know, that this is necessarily a high volume keyword. This is a percentage here, right? A percentage of all searches and when they were made. So this doesn't tell us anything about volume. But now, Let's do a different search. Let's search something we know that is going to be problematic. Best webcams for jellyfish, right? Literally no one has ever typed this into Google. And we see this says, huh, your search doesn't have enough data to show here. And so I can already see the grins on some of your faces as you're looking at this, you say, wait a minute. So where did they draw the line? Where did they say there suddenly is enough data to show the graph, right? And when we start asking that question, it opens up a world of possibilities for us because Google is the only one who knows. Maybe we give a second to Bing, right? They're the only ones with enough um, data to, to know how many people actually search this. All these companies, they're too small, they don't know. And so we started to say, well, this is very interesting. Where's the line? And so we started to see where we did searches and it showed us the, the full dashboard of data. It's somewhere around 10,000 searches a month. And we've looked at that at dozens and dozens and dozens of queries to verify that. It's right in there. Now there's something you need to know about that number. When I say 10,000, it actually doesn't matter. We're gonna talk about that in a minute. Um, but 
we're seeing it's around 10,000. Then what happens? This is where it gets so wonderful. Uh, best horse breeds for beginners. Haha. <laughs> now we see something even more interesting. We do see a graph of data with Spartan information. We do see information here, but not here or here. Now, they need more information. They need a larger data set in order to fill this out and in order to fill this out. The related topics, they can easily get by just seeing what those people search uh, elsewhere. So this isn't too hard to get. And the gross keyword isn't hard to get. These are harder to fill out these two boxes. And so we said, well, again, where's the line? Where do they start saying there's not enough data to show here? And we compared it with our own information. We sound that that's somewhere between five and 10,000 searches a month. And so this suddenly makes us very powerful, very powerful uh, to know how this works because this is the holy grail. This has always been the holy grail. If you actually know how many people are searching an article, then you can just go all in on this, um, on this, on that article and win it, right? Just go crazy because it's worth it. You know it's going to be worth it when you get there. The problem is we've had to um, say, we've had to ration out our efforts on different search phrases because we may get it and then it's only worth 150 searches a month. Great, wasted my time, right? So this is pretty incredible, but it's also limiting as well. Uh, and, and, well, okay. For, for one thing I have to talk about before that someone very wisely mentioned in the last, um, the last session of this webinar, somebody said, I'm kind of skeptical on this. I, you know, I'm comparing data on that we're seeing here, the 10,000 and the 5,000 numbers I mentioned, and we're comparing that to Google search console and we don't always see a match. I guess what I'm going to say here is it doesn't actually matter. What really matters is that we can accurately categorize a post into high traffic, medium traffic, low traffic, and essentially no traffic, right? If we can do that, we know it's going to be worth the effort. Now, whether that number is 10,000 or 15 or four or whatever, whatever we're going to call that category, that's actually beside the point. In fact, I kind of regret even giving those numbers in the search analysis tool. It may have been more wise to just say large traffic, medium traffic, small traffic. And so don't get hung up on the number. That's really just not. Um, oh, jellyfishwebcams.com is available. That's pretty exciting. Um, <laughs> um, anyway, you, you, you get the point. That's really just not the point, the numbers. But if we can accurately say this one is bigger than this one, that's super powerful. And so that's really what we're talking about. Now, the other thing we have to mention on, uh, well, two more things we have to mention here. The first is, okay, Jim, cool. You've identified a tool that can accurately show us when something has around 10,000 searches a month, but it's not that helpful for two reasons. Reason number one, it's not doing semantic search for us. So when I search best web, I'll just do it here. Let's talk, let's, let's go let's do this for real, right? If I go on here, this is not a cherry picked example. I just know it's how it's going to come out. If I search best webcams, we know it has data. Then let's say on something I would search on Google that uh, Google would recognize is the same search, but trends won't recognize it's the same search. So uh, this time I'm going to search excellent ex oh, excellent cameras for the top of your computer, right? We all know that's best webcams, right? But it's going to show no data. So it's not actually doing super powerful semantic search for us. It does some element of this, um, but uh, yeah, it does some element of semantic search, but it's not nearly as powerful as Google search on the web. Uh, on the web. If it did do that, wow, I would have an even bigger smile on my face about this technique. Um, and so you do have to still be smart about the way that you're typing these in there to get the idea of the information. 
um, recognizing it, uh, how it's typed. So that's one thing. Now, the other uh, way that we could uh, argue, be, be skeptical again against this technique is you say, okay, but if it's only identifying those things that are 10,000 searches a month plus, it's actually not much more useful than one of the commercial tools such as Ahrefs and SEMrush, etc. I fully agree uh, with that actually. So on those commercial tools such as Ahrefs, you guys already know this, we've said this for years, don't believe the search volume. But what we've also said for a long time is they're extrapolating from a small data set to make those assumptions on how many people are searching. And so if they say that a particular search phrase has 10,000 searches a month uh, or more, it's actually probably right. But what they do miss is sometimes there are searches that do have 10,000 searches, but they show it much lower. If you kind of let that sink in for a minute, you'll kind of see why that makes sense because they're extrapolating from a small data set. And so they miss some in those tools. So that's reason number one. Reason number two is that five to 10,000 category on Google Trends where we're seeing that partial data, I'm finding that being a more accurate predictor of, of medium search volume than what I'm seeing in the tools, where in that 5,000 range, they're just still pretty wrong. And so it's, it's, it's pretty powerful uh, what, what we're seeing there from Trends. Ricky? I was gonna say, and, and I mean, anyone with much of a, with a statistic background was gonna understand that. And then as that data set gets even smaller to the smaller than 5,000 searches a month, um, then we've got, we've got that law of, um, small numbers issue here, uh, where, you know, if it, sh if it happens to show up in their data set, cool, they're going to recognize it, but they're probably going to overestimate the search volume. If it doesn't show up much in their data set, if it's underrepresented in their data set, because it's a random sampling, then it's going to be underrepresented. And so that's why we see a lot of zero search volume searches that we know are wrong. One, because the tools don't also do semantic search, but two, because of the statistical um, likelihood of them being wrong when the when the search volume is small because that search showed up less in their data set. And so really what we're finding is it's more valuable to place these topics in you know search queries in buckets rather than assigning an estimated search volume and then assuming that that happens to be true. Yeah, exactly. And, and a specific example of where this happened. We have uh, one that we're going to show in the course what the search phrase is. Uh, I wrote the article for it myself. That one article brings in 24,000 page views a month, almost all from, from organic search. Let that sink in. 24,000 searches a month from organic search. You search some of those things in the tool, and it's showing way less, so much that I would have questioned writing it if I had, uh, if I had uh, believed the tool. But if you go off Google Trends, you would have known it right away because uh, it's showing that full dashboard of data. And so that's, that's an example of this. Really, uh, the, the focus shouldn't be on, aha, Google Trends is now a silver bullet for us. It's what data can we rely on and what data can't we rely on. I think Google Trends is a very powerful way to do this. But now we also need to turn our attention to the commercial tools that do have value. And frankly, a few years ago where we said we just don't use this them, the tools have improved a lot uh, in that time. And for the last, oh, year and a half or so, we've said, hey, you know, we're subscribed to some of the tools. We like some of the tools. Just don't believe them search for search volume. Now we're saying they're getting even better. Maybe at the 10,000 mark, we're saying, all right, maybe we do believe this, um, this uh, information. But we also found some incredibly powerful ways to use those tools without, with, and we still ignoring search volume. And so you'll see in the new course, we have the search analysis uh, lessons anyway. It's also separated as a separate course. Then we have the writing lessons. Then we added some lessons toward the end of the course that are marked as advanced search analysis. And um, it's not that, the, that those lessons are like so complicated that you're not gonna be able to figure it out if you're not advanced. It's not like that it's hard. It's that it's, it's just not the primary method. And I think using those tools could send a lot of people down the wrong path. And so we need to focus on the fundamentals that we found to be the most reliable first. 
but many of you really should look at considering some of these uh, commercial tools. Now, I did a tour the uh, search analysis tools all across the internet, um, tried all of them, wasted a lot of income school money trying and paying for them, uh, putting them through the paces. And I, I think, frankly, I'd tried all of them before, but I wanted to see, hey, have there done any updates that are uh, relevant for us? Um, so I looked at them recently as well. And in my opinion, AHREFs is a pretty good step ahead of the pack right now. Um, and just to be transparent, SEMrush has a rich affiliate program. I, I mean, it's rich. They're giving recurring monthly commissions uh, for their affiliate uh, for their uh, affiliate deal. And so the fact that I'm recommending AHREFs that has zero affiliate program whatsoever means we, re we that that's what we think. And it also I, I hopefully hopefully says, we, we really do care about you guys succeeding. Um, Simrush, though, I would say, has a, a lot of, they, they really copy a lot of Ahrefs functionality. And if you're doing local SEO, it'd probably be my, my top pick, uh, Simrush. But for what we're doing, I really feel like Ahrefs has the leg up pretty handily. Um, I, I, I like what they're doing. Uh, it, it's, it's a powerful tool, again, just be really careful. Do not get caught in the trap of believing the search volume data, especially when it's under that 10,000 mark. And don't believe that you have to have the tool to succeed at search analysis. And that's kind of the point. The primary methodology of search analysis does not rely on these tools at all. There are just some advanced techniques that can help you identify some good opportunities, especially for bloggers who are really good at competitive analysis because you're going to identify some topics that are definitely going to have traffic. They're definitely going to have search volume, but they're probably also going to have pretty stiff competition. And if your blog and your writer are not yet ready to, you know, address that type of competition. And if you don't recognize that that's the competition you're up against, you're just going to spend time creating content that you're not, it's not going to get any organic traffic because you're not going to win. I'm seeing several comments about how expensive it is. Yeah. <laughs> oh man, we totally agree. It's crazy yeah. expensive. Fortunately, they do have a seven day trial. And so you could do your seven day trial, just go crazy on search analysis, and then you're good for another six months, right? Good um, point. And so that, that's one option for you, but also you just, you do not need it to follow our method. That's just in the advanced lessons. If you're, if you want to do that, I think it's valuable. We will pay for it, um, but you do not do it to be, you do not need to have it to be effective. Now, you know, Jim spent a lot of time here talking about sort of our validation stage of search analysis. The ideation stage of search analysis has also evolved and we're suggesting, you know, get your ideas from anywhere. Up until now, we've, you know, we've really used the Google auto suggest methodology. It used to be really good. But for really over a year now, as we've been using it, just perusing the internet, but also um, doing search analysis, we're finding more and more often that Google's auto suggestions, how are those the top searches? I, I don't think Google's giving us the goods there anymore the way they used to. And so while it is still a good methodology to use, um, really we're saying when it comes to ideation, get your ideas from anywhere that makes sense. That means you know, if you are using a key, you know, keyword sheeter, um, answer the public, if you're using um, uh, any of those tools, Ahrefs also has some tools for that. Yes, whatever. Yep. Doesn't really matter. It's the validation stage where we determine what we're going to write. And so in the ideation stage, for your first 30 blog posts, you may come up with a list of 100 to 150 that you're actually going to whittle down um, before you actually go write them. And that's going to allow you to really hit the target a lot more often, as opposed to just writing a whole ton of articles based on the ideation stage and then, and writing them all and just, and some of them win. We're going to be able to help you kind of hone in on which ones are most likely to succeed. So um, we do want to show, and I fully, uh, you know, Ricky and I are definitely on the same page there. Use whatever you like for ideation. It's really just the process of getting ideas. But I will say, especially if you're new, you do have to be careful even with ideation 
yes, we're going to put it through validation. And by validation, I just mean we're going to check search volume and competition before we decide to write the post. But when you're just generating ideas, if you're new, I would really stick to our primary ideation method because you won't yet have a sense for what works and what doesn't. And so I just want to show very quickly what that primary ideation method is. So let's say craft uh, glue. I don't know. Uh, it's the first thing that came to my head. Uh, so let's say I search uh, um, uh, why does craft glue and then we see the autocompletes stick, smell good, work, come from horses, taste like, get hot on fabric, etc. right? The autocomplete is not useless. Uh, sometimes we get great things from the autocomplete and that's not going to suddenly change. But what we're finding to give us better results is just type why does craft glue, just that, partial search and just press, press enter. And then we look right here at people also ask. And these questions are just less crazy for a blog post. Um, what's the best glue, glue for crafts? What's the best glue to use on craft foam? How do you make homemade glue stronger? Is craft glue the same as school glue? I mean, you can just see right from that example, I would way prefer to write on these people also asks than the autocomplete. I, I'm seeing a lot of nodding heads I, I, in the webinar. I think you guys are seeing this. That's way better. Um, and it's just what we're seeing across the board is that at some point over the last year or two, Google has slowly deprecated autocomplete and we're just seeing weirder and weirder stuff in there. Now, I, I honestly believe that the reason that we're seeing weirder stuff in autocomplete right now is because of SEO. I, I think Google was giving the goods that they want to hide from us in autocomplete and they've been willing to deprecate that user experience of quickness of search a little bit in order to, to hide the valuable keywords. They've worked so hard to hide that kind of information. But I don't think they're courageous enough to ruin the user experience on the SERP. The SERP meaning the, the actual result page, the search engine ranking page. Why? Because Google is killing for money. They want money and they earn money when they keep us on the SERP longer so that we can see the ads on the page. Remember how it used to be one or maybe two ads on the SERP? Now, how many do we see? Now, sometimes we'll see five ads before the first organic result. That's a 2020 change. That's not that old. Um, they're really focused on how to keep people on the search engine ranking page. And I just don't think they dare um, take the people also ask queries. I mean, they're designing the, those people also ask queries right here to be the thing that's going to keep you on the page. And so they don't want to put anything random here. They want to put the things that are most likely to keep you. Also, remember this people also ask you to be way down the page. Now they're cramming it closer and closer to the top. They like this section and so do we because it's giving us valuable information. And so in my opinion, by far that writing a portion of a question and pressing enter and seeing what's in people also ask is the very best ideation method out there right now. And so that's what we're using to generate the ideas. Then we put them through the validation steps of figuring out the traffic and competition. Once we've done that, then the sheet itself is going to tell us what the priority is and should it be a response or a staple post. But you should know your brain is better than the Excel sheet. And sometimes you should override it where you just say, yeah, but it's going to take me longer to write this or something. Override it. No problem. Um, and then you come up with your topic and you actually write it. That's the process for search analysis. There, there are other um, changes that I think would be easy to overlook. Um, some are like kind of small. For example, um, the titles of posts. It used to be that we recommended under 72 characters. And now we're saying under 60 because we don't want to see them get truncated. Um, and so in the search analysis spreadsheet, it's going to warn you if you go over 60 characters. 
Now, Google is, doesn't care how many characters are there. It's about how wide it actually is, the number of pixels. And some letters, M, W, are wider than some other letters like I's and L's. And so it's not a hard and fast rule how many characters you're allowed, but we're trying to help people stay under that. Now, that's not, the truncation there is the, as a user experience thing, it's not an SEO thing. And so if you are writing a, a title for your blog post and um, there's a word or a phrase that you need to use in that title because that's what it's about and it forces it to go longer, that's okay. It's not gonna hurt you from an SEO standpoint. It's more about the user experience and clickability. That seems like it's a little thing, but now add to that, that um, Google is now starting to index more and more, not just full articles, but sections of articles. Like every piece of your article is indexed as content. And so now what we're seeing is a subheading being treated as a title in the SERP and a section of that subheading being used as the meta summary. And that is the search result. When people click on that search result in the SERP, it takes them to that section of the blog post, not just to the entire post. And so now, instead of just writing titles that are under 60 characters, we're saying write subheadings that are generally under 60 characters, and that would work as a standalone title, and write your content in such a way that it could do well in the SERP, even if it's just a section of a blog post, which leads to kind of the next point. And this is a big thing that could very easily get overlooked uh, with the changes here. And that is that we're not just, I mean, it used to be that, that people focused on keywords. We said, don't, don't focus on keywords, focus on search queries. What things are people asking? Not just, you know, what magic words should you include in your blog post? Now it's not just about a search query. Now it's often multiple search queries. What's the topic that people are looking at? And what are the things that they're likely to search? And then craft content that's going to be able to rank for those multiple searches. That doesn't mean go off topic throughout the blog post, but rather, you know, write the blog post the way you would write the blog post. But again, like look at those kind of tangential search queries and write those individual subsections in a way where if somebody does that search for the content that would go in that subsection, it, it fits, it works and it answers the question well. It's, it used to be that we would say the entire article needs to be totally on point for the main search query for Google to rank it. And that was generally true. We're not seeing that anymore. We're seeing that Google is wanting to give a good search result independent of whether or not it's standalone within the article, as long as the result is good. Yeah, so that goes straight to what Jay Wake was asking in the, in the comment section. He says, let's say you look at the people also ask questions and they're basically five different things all paraphrasing, all paraphrasing the same idea. How do you choose between them? And, and that's exactly what you're talking about, Ricky. You don't. You write a great resource that happens to answer all those questions rather than saying, I'm going to answer this one and maybe hopefully I'm going to rank for the other. We're writing about the topic there. Now we do have to be very careful when we say we're writing about the topic um, that we aren't just getting stuff off our chest. It does still have to match a search query, but what we're saying is we're, we're matching um, a problem that people have rather than matching the way that they describe that problem as they type it into Google. Okay, so the other thing that you'll see on the search analysis tool is as you type in the information, you're going to find that we're writing on more competitive topics. Um, the reason that we're writing on more competitive topics than we did before is because we're able to, do, to determine the search, the search volume more accurately. And I mean, because of that, we don't have to just pick up the crumbs that the big publications leave behind, right? We don't have to just say, oh, well, this one has essentially no competition. I guess I'll write on that. Look, everybody's missing answer targets. What's the last time you read a blog post with something that was clearly an answer target? It's still not that common. Every once in a while, I'll come across a, a member's website and I'm like, yeah, you go. Um, but it's still not that common still. I mean, 19 posts out of 20, you'll see they've made no effort uh, to write an answer target to win, um, to win the featured snippet. And so we can compete in a way that we've never been able to before. Really, I mean, even just on that one technique, 
you need to take that answer target course and then take it again and again and again and again. It is critical uh, to this. And because of that technique and just our focus on being better writers and taking more time with fewer words, I feel that we can compete with the more competitive things. Now, obviously we have to still take competition into, into account. The tool is already gonna tell you sometimes, just don't write this, it's too competitive. Um, but there are times that we need to move more competitive and one area where that's happening is in commercial intent searches where we have just completely avoided in the past and now we're really diving in with both feet. It's because of what happened just a few weeks ago. Now, a lot of you, uh, in fact, I saw a couple, uh, it's kind of fun seeing you on a webinar that I can actually see how you're responding to things rather than just recording a YouTube video. I saw a couple of you look like, what, what happened last month? I'm so happy that you, that you feel that way. Um, I'm in a Facebook group uh, that I, I follow for the express uh, reason of knowing what other people in the industry outside of our income school bubble uh, talks about. They were running around with their hair on fire last month. People were panicked. Their websites were tanking. They were all saying, hey, quick, sell your site. Try to get it listed on Empire Flippers because we're, we just lost a ton of traffic and the revenue is about to go down, right? Um, and the reason that they, that they were all saying that is because last month there was a product review update, an algorithm update that specifically targeted crap reviews. Now, why is nobody in income school? I don't know that I saw a single post of somebody saying they lost traffic uh, last month. Why? Because we've been saying this for a long time. Just don't write that commercial intent crap review stuff. Um, you know, if you don't actually know the product and can actually provide real helpful information, just don't even bother. Yes, there is some value to summarizing the web, but and write about something that you can uh, provide a helpful resource for. And because we've been teaching that for so long, it was a complete non-issue in, in the community. We avoided it. We avoided a big one that hurt a lot of blogs. And so now, why are we saying let's dive into product reviews? Because finally, Google got wise to this, right? And they said, hey, we can identify when somebody's just summarizing the web and giving you 21 best office chairs and they've never touched a single one of them. And so let's hammer them. And so those, those posts just sunk in the, in the SERPs. Uh, I just saw a website today that somebody was wanting to sell to us uh, that lost 65% of the traffic because they had focused on product reviews and there were crap reviews. And so now we're saying let's get in because Google's better at identifying the good blog posts. It wasn't that they made blog reviews disappear. It's that they said, yeah, but it's gotta be real. It's gotta be good, helpful, knowledgeable information. And so now we feel like the time is right and let's dive in and let's write that best X for Y. Let's write that review. Let's just do it the right way. Absolutely. And so you'll see with that, for those of you who are pretty familiar with the old, with the old course, the recommended product section is no more. We're not teaching it in Project 24. That's not to say don't do it. If you have it, you can keep it. It's fine. Um, but where this makes the most sense is if you have an audience, if you're an influencer, if you have a YouTube channel and people want to know, hey, I wonder what gear this person recommends. Cool. Have a recommended products or a recommended gear page. Absolutely. No question. But there is a lot of attrition between you know, when somebody's reading your blog post and then, okay, I'll click over to this page where they have their actual review on a, you know, recommended products page. And then maybe I'll click from there to the, the product. Each time we make them click, there's more attrition. And so what we're saying now is if you have a product to recommend, go make, go write a real review of that product, get a hold of the product, do it, do it right and do a good job and then sell the product right there in the article. And by sell it, I mean, pitch it, like put the, put the, uh, the link there and get people straight from there over to the product. Um, the, the attrition rate's gonna be lower, the conversion rate's gonna be higher, and so you're gonna be able to earn more that way. So let's minimize the number of clicks, the number of pages people have to read through by eliminating the recommended product section again, unless, or rather not, I mean, don't eliminate it if you have it, but rather let's not create it unless it really does make sense to have that hub for sending people over from your YouTube channel or from your social media, et cetera. Yeah, so if you're a, a YouTuber, you're an influencer somewhere else, you 
probably want this. It's going to be good yeah. for affiliate. But just from cold traffic to blog posts, we're just not getting enough people clicking over to them anymore. Well, I, as if, as long as I didn't miss anything, Ricky, I think those no, I are think um, the updates. But we do want to end with a really important message. If all you get from this webinar is what changed and you adopt a few of the strategies, you change your word count, you eliminate a pillar post, that, that's a pretty moderate change to your success rate. And so I, I'm very concerned that many of you will say, okay, cool, got it, and move on, keep doing what you've always done. And I feel like that would be a huge missed opportunity. Please, for the next two months, go watch. I mean, it's fine if you want to buzz through and binge them this weekend and just get a, night, get a lay of the land, fine. But after that, go watch one video before you write a blog post. Then tomorrow, go watch one more video and then write a blog post. There are so many subtle things in there that will make you way better. And the biggest one, the biggest change is what Ricky did in the course. Uh, really, the search analysis process, um, I, I think, is a, a really cool change. I could not be more excited about it. But if, if anything is going to impact you more, it's probably going to be what Ricky did uh, in focusing on teaching you how to be a better writer um, in blogging. And that's the thing. I mean, that's what Google has thousands of engineers and all this effort to do is identify the good resources. And I've mentioned this a couple times, but we were disappointed during the last Ultimate Content Warrior when we were looking through a lot of you guys' content. Some of it is amazing. Some of you guys are just fantastic. But in general, we felt the average was too low um, in terms of the quality of the writing that we were seeing. And so if anything's going to impact your results big time, it's that writing section. So please take advantage of everything. Go through the quizzes that we created in there. Write each of the types of, Ricky made a different video showing how he would style each different type of blog post. Do it and actually implement, right? I promise that will give you the result. Even if you're at the stage where you're outsourcing and you're scaling, et cetera, once you've already kind of proven yourself, go back to the fundamentals. Give us 30 days work through them, and I promise your success rate is going to change, I mean dramatically, if you'll go through it that way. Otherwise, it was just a nice pretty webinar and we talked about some exciting things, but it probably won't make much difference. And when it comes to the new content, the new post types, the original research, if there's anything in the teaching that's confusing, one of the things that I've really learned over the last couple of years of Project 24 is that um, you know, for us, helping people succeed it really is a combination of a couple things. It's the methodologies and having the right methodologies, but it's also our ability to teach those methodologies in a way that helps people that they can really understand it and implement it. And so if you find that something isn't clear, I'm very open to the feedback because I'm, I'm, I am willing to rapidly iterate on those, that content to make it as good as possible for you. Um, and so please submit that feedback through, um, through the community. We have a feedback section there. Um, I'd love to see how you're implementing these things on your sites. I'd love to see examples. So please don't hesitate to, to tell us when something's unclear because I want to become a better teacher. Okay. Uh, we got a really good question. Uh, so this com concludes the part we had for you, but we do want to take some questions, especially because we feel bad uh, about uh, the, the tech. So we are going to stick around and, and answer some questions, but that's the main content we have for you. So Anne, Anne Maria um, says, the question I keep trying to figure out is how do Jim and Ricky get their authors to be really authoritative? We don't want to reproduce the web, but how do you hire writers, college students, who can suddenly write impactful articles about a pet they've, they've never owned? Such a good question. Such a good question. So there are two things. One, outsourcing content does not absolve you of a responsibility as the site owner. So for example, I'm working on, on Backfire right now. I really want to build this thing up, the actual website this summer. And so I thought, man, 
it's pretty technical information. Can I really expect to somebody who doesn't even know anything about it to be able to write it? And I realized, yeah, there are some blog posts I just have to avoid entirely. It's just too technical. They, they just won't be able to put it together. But there are a ton of things that if they did the research, they could actually put together a pretty decent resource. And then I'm going to come in as the site owner and I'm going to add the anecdotes. I'm going to add the pro level information. I'm going to correct anything, etc. So outsourcing does not absolve you of responsibility. That's thing one. Thing two is this. If what you do when you write a blog post is you just say, okay, um, uh, you know, do you have to have a hunting license to kill a squirrel? Okay. That's the term we're writing on. Well, if all I do is go read a bunch of blog posts and write it, I'm just summarizing the web. That's the lowest level of content on there with our writers, every single write, every single article, including for, for customers, we have one of our senior writers look at it first and they give them an assignment to go do research uh, on the topic, original research. And so for example, they could just get on the phone and call a couple fish and game offices around the country and say, do I have to have a, a hunting license to kill a squirrel? Um, and then I can give an actual quote from an expert in there, right? Does a writer at Fox News or CNN know anything about uh, whatever some tiny a uh, nerdy thing happening in Bitcoin? No, they're not experts. They went and got a journalism degree, but they don't know anything about it. And so what do they do? They're journalists. They go find the information and they present it as such. And so that is a much higher level of content than just summarizing the web. It's not the expert level of content though. I fully admit that. I, I, I believe it's summarized web then we get to journalist and then somebody that's actually expert. We can't always be experts, so let's at least be journalists. And I would say that that's the case if you're outsourcing your writing. I mean, you're not usually going to get expert content unless you are able to find freelancers with expertise in that field. Another thing that's been really interesting to us is as we hire writers, we used to focus on, um, you know, marketing the job openings to you know, the English department, the business department, the communications department. And, and then we found like, we actually got a lot of applicants when we opened it up to the psychology department. And now we're like, what about engineering? It's engineering students. What about physics students and stuff? And so now it's like, wait, we they got people who are literally- They do know something about. Right, like, and they're literally learning how to write technical documentation. Like these are people who, that's what they're studying. So could we- have a higher level of expertise and a higher level of research by just hiring, outsourcing to writers that do have an area of expertise? I think the answer is yes. Michael Belfry says, can we book a site review through contentwarrior.com? Not yet, but we are working toward that. Um, we, yeah, we're working toward it. Right now, we feel like the greatest need in terms of services to offer is the article writing for reasons that we've discussed. Um, we feel like that's what people need the most right now, but it's coming. We're going to get there. It's going to take a while for us yep. to fail. Jasper Peters says, will the new approach have any impact on the battleship method? I don't really think so. Um, the battleship method, you already have data on how it's performing. And right. so uh, I, I, I think it's the search analysis changes once you have an existing site and you know how things are doing. And so I, I don't see any major impacts there other than uh, we're not gonna be writing pillar posts, right? Yeah, um, C. Rollins asks about uh, the writing service. Is it open to all? It is, um, it sold out quick, but um, the inventory is done on a weekly basis. And so what we don't wanna do is like get super behind on inventory, like do that on a monthly basis and then have people waiting a month or two months for an article. And so every week, the inventory starts over. Uh, and so come back next week. And we're also working on uh, increasing our capacity there. And so over the next few months, you're gonna see more availability, but the service is open to the public now. Yeah, uh, we're gonna be really adding like doubling or tripling our capacity, but we wanna do it right. Where there's no way we're gonna get do this thing where somebody orders and we don't get, get to you in a month we want to make sure we do it right. And so we're going to roll it out slow. Um, okay. Uh, sorry. Oh, 
Anwar says, how can I train my writer? So in the previous version of the course, and the video is still available, we haven't taken anything down from the 60 steps, um, but we had a single video that we allowed people to share with uh, any of the writers that you're employee to train them on how to write this way. We don't have that video for this new process. We hope to add it in the, in the future, um, but uh, we're, we're fighting some major legal issues with people copying and ripping off our content. They, they're either just taking videos or they're just taking all of the work that we did and essentially teaching it their own way and lay, smacking different labels on it and then selling it into other courses. Uh, we're working on patents to protect our processes. We're working on, re on registered copyrights. And uh, we, we've, we have some uh, things there that we have to do to protect it because it's, it's crazy. I mean, I, I've spent maybe one in four days over the last few months working on legal stuff. It's just been, oh, drives me crazy that we even need to do that. But it's just, it's gotten to a point that it, it's absurd. It like threatens what we're doing. And so we don't have that right now. I'm sorry. Your income school is licensed to you um, and you alone, um, your, uh, your membership. But we are looking for ways if you have writers to do it. If you own a service, you can contact Anna um, and she is working through some people that maybe have bulk people of a lot of people that need to be trained. Yeah, no, and that is an issue. Like you hire one freelance writer and want to teach him our methodology. Like uh, that, that does get kind of tough. So reach out to Anna um, and we will, we are working on some, some ways to do that in a legitimate way. Um, but as of right now, I mean, someone training their writer or writers is no different than someone sharing their login details with somebody else or training a whole different group of people who, um, who are paying them to train them. I mean, at what point does it become um, theft? of the information. And so we're looking at, we're creating ways to legitimize it so that it's not theft. So it's actually fully legitimate. So again, if you have a need for that, please just reach out. Um, as we see what needs exist, kind of what levels of needs exist, we'll be able to come up with solutions that legitimize all the people who want to do it in a legitimate way. JR asks, do you think the 1000 word response posts are more likely to be picked off by competitors? Uh, no, I actually think they're harder. Uh, to be to be picked off because uh, when your post is very very long uh, somebody can write on the same topic and take all the same subheadings etc writing 1000 words is like for sure harder than writing 1250 words it's just tougher uh, even if the time of two hours is the same uh, writing in a compact way but still having doing more research in fact um, and putting it in there in a helpful way in fewer words, that's harder. And so I feel like it, it only helps us in that regard. I mean, if they're going to copy and paste, they can copy and paste it, whether it's 3,000 words or 1,000 words. But in terms of somebody just picking it off by writing their own version of it, I feel like it makes us stronger. Absolutely. I just tried to respond to someone and meant to send it to everyone and I sent it to Caesar. So there okay. you go, Caesar. Um, no, yes. but... Um, Sorry, is Uber, so, is Uber Suggest comparable to Ahrefs and SEMrush? I would say no. Uh, it's a valuable tool. I would use it for ideation, but Ahrefs and SEMrush are on a very different level than Uber Suggest. Um, I, again, I think Ahrefs is the top of the heap for what we do, and there's no affiliate program for it. Uh, that's just, that's our real recommendation. Uh, we very much care about you guys succeeding. The sniper discussion the pod, that we talked about on the podcast, where's the line? Um, the line is where you draw it for yourself. Um, Jim and I actually talk about this extensively. Where's the line for us? And both of us feel pretty strongly that we would not take a site, print out their whole hit list of their best articles, and just go knock them off one at a time. Um, but to look at who the competitors are, who competitors are in the industry, both large and medium sites, um, and look at the general topics that are working well and using that to influence what I do. Yeah, I would, I would absolutely do that. But I, I, when it comes to taking someone's entire, you know, successful search analysis, that to me feels like you've gone too far and you've stolen, but that's, that's where I'm at. So everyone kind of has to decide that for themselves. We certainly don't want to be encouraging any form of um, theft. And I think if any, at any point, if you go in and, 
use then that person's article as the research for yours and you end up just scraping it, you know, and, and spinning it. I mean, where's the original value there? So um, you've got to figure out where the line is for you. The line's actually pretty far back for me. Um, and if I went past my line, my wife would probably slap me um, or worse because she's like ultra ethical. <laughs> so like for me, the line's pretty early on. Um, T. Tracy says, what do you do if the majority of terms identified for the website just don't, don't show anything on Google Trends? Now, remember, our goal, we're going to, you'll see this in the course very clearly, our goal is 1,000 page views a month per article. Now, that's just a goal. We won't always hit it, but that's what we're trying to get to. And so, um, if you're never seeing anything in Google Trends, that actually does concern me, Right. Um, if, if nothing here has the high search volume, that's concerning. But if they really are a thousand searches a month, it's never going to show in Google Trends and it's still very much worth writing. Okay. But what I, the reason that I think this is powerful is we did a batch of content on um, Outdoor Troop when we, when we owned it on paramotors. And I thought, this is great. There's nothing on the web for paramotors and it's, uh, I was very much into it, watching it on YouTube and stuff. And so I thought it must be getting a bunch of searches. Well, they ranked number one, but they didn't bring any search, any traffic in. And so I could have avoided that problem niche wide by saying, well, Paramotor does show Google Trends. But when I try to divide it up anyway, best Paramotor, whatever, nothing shows on Google Trends. And so that should have been a sign to me to say, hold on, search volume in this niche is just too small. I need to broaden my niche. And so I hope that many people start the course, pick their niche, go through the search analysis process and say, Ooh, I can't find any high priority terms and say, maybe I better try a different niche or maybe I need to broaden my niche, et cetera. And so that's a good, that's a good thing that you're noticing that before, you know, just doing this for two years and then saying, whoops, there was no search volume. Um, Shrat Katawa says, how can I uh, identify more base of the pyramid type questions since he's an expert? Ask a beginner, uh, somebody that's gone through it recently. Uh, that, that's really the best way. It's easy to forget those, those questions once you're more advanced. Um, I'll quick answer one and then come back. Um, Mike asks, will we be offering a research analysis or a search analysis service on Content Warrior? Not right now, but we, it's coming. we yeah, we've talked about many different potential services um, that we can offer on Content Warrior that would help Project 24 members. Content, Warrior, as, is, Content Warrior is the services arm of Income School. Uh, right. So we, we expect to have blog post review and site review and search analysis and WordPress help and those kind of things. But we, frankly, we could have launched those all at the beginning and we would have done all of them okay. Um, right. And so we wanted to focus on, well, let's get this problem of article writing and let's get it as best as we possibly can. Once we feel like we got this nailed, we'll move on and open one more service to make sure our quality is as best as it can be. Now, this next question is, you know, if you're targeting an audience in a country with a much smaller population than the U.S., then do you look at the search volume numbers through Google Trends? Do you look at it differently? Um, you know, in Google Trends, you can look at worldwide. You can look at country specific. Um, and I, I do think that if you look like, you know, let's say I look UK specific at a search term, it, oftentimes it's not going to show any data. Um, even for something where if it was worldwide or maybe in the U S it would. Um, and I, and I, because of that, it, it does kind of change the way that the numbers balance out, um, in terms of the high, medium and low buckets. One thing I would keep in mind is that if you are targeting, you know, a smaller potential audience, um, the thousand page views a month per post may also not be, um, may not be something that you can really plan on being able to achieve. And so. Um, how you do the buckets maybe differs a little bit. Looks like Jim has something to say about this. 
Yeah, I do. And I, it's because I feel bad that I hadn't covered that yet. So by default, yeah. it's going to uh, bring you into, into your country. Mine's, you know, obviously going to show the United States as a default. I'll go back one. Um, so best horse breeds for beginners. We see partial data. Uh, these two boxes don't have enough data. I switch to worldwide and I'm going to see, we get one more box here, but still not quite enough here. And so um, the, the US traffic is really valuable for, for really in the, any industry. Um, you know, Canada, UK traffic, Australia traffic, Germany traffic, also very valuable as well as many other countries. Um, but I, I'm doing the searches generally just United States because I, I don't want to, I want to make sure that for most of the sites that we're working on, we aren't getting swayed with something strongly from a country that has very little value in terms of ads, right? That sounds horrible to say. We're just talking about ad revenue, right? Um, but I, I mean, unfortunately, it just is what it is. Traffic to India, your RPM may literally be three cents, right? For a lot of queries, if you have mostly India-based traffic, it could literally be three cents as your RPM. And in the US, it could be over 20 bucks. And so I'm generally setting it to US, but like horses, well, horses are the same all around the world, right? They got them everywhere. And so it definitely is something I would be flipping between the worldwide and the and US uh, because it's all informative, right? I, I am focused on the ads, but I also want to, and I want to make money, but also, hey, if we can pad this with traffic from around the world as well, I certainly care about that. So uh, it, it's just all informative. Just keep that in mind as you're going through. Absolutely. All right. Should we take two more questions and call it? Yeah, maybe two more. Why don't we each take one? Okay. Um, <laughs> okay. I got to re read Mike Greenlee's. The, no the new course will help your blog. So success won't feel like a slog. <laughs> if you want some Thai curry, don't be in a hurry and follow the new course and vlogs. That's just <laughs> really beautiful. Mike. That's, that's an excellent that, poem. <laughs> if this weren't on video, I would lie and say it brought a tear to my eye. <laughs> <laughs> That was my oh, question. Boy. That's the lot. That's all I have. Okay, there you go. Um, people also ask her questions. Does this mean that they're answered as response posts? When does it become a staple post? Um, really, if you as you use the new search analysis tool, it'll start to become apparent. And really, it, it does help to not just try to create a distinction where there doesn't need to be. Sometimes for a staple post you're answering one main question, but we're gonna cover the topic with greater depth and we're gonna do more original research and we're probably gonna end up, in fact, we're intentionally gonna end up trying to pick up some of those tangential search queries, write multiple answer targets, et cetera, um, so that we can win for more than one search query, but we are primarily focused on one question. And so that it, that is not really necessarily the differentiating factor. Um, but as you use the tool, you're going to find that based upon the level of competition and based upon just how big the topic is, how much traffic it's likely to bring in, it's going to help you pick which type of post it is, which is essentially helping you pick how long the post should be. There's a type of staple post that's essentially a response post following the post recipe, but just bigger, maybe a few more subheadings or maybe just more depth of the topic within the subheadings. And really the only distinction there is just the, the depth and maybe even slightly the breadth that you cover the topic, but it really is basically like a long response post. And so, yeah, I would say that it's not how many search queries we're answering or whatever that necessarily differentiates between the two. It's more about how difficult it's gonna to be to win and how much it's worth it to win. And so therefore, how much does it justify putting more effort um, into that post? Um, Jimmy James is asking, um, he's saying he's a little bit unsure about which bucket to put them in, you know, what's under a thousand, what's a thousand to 500. Just, um, I, I just wanted to add one thing that we, we still have to use a little gray matter. Uh, and that, that okay. distinction specifically 
under a thousand and a thousand to five uh, five thousand. That's the hardest one to make for sure. And so uh, I, I wish it were more clear, but even Google Trends isn't going to help us there. Just nobody has that data to give us. Uh, but we do show the informative things you can look at for making that judgment call um, as you're as you're going through things. But remember. Don't worry about the numbers. In fact, I maybe I should even just update it, remove the numbers and just call it large, medium, small. We're talking about buckets and telling which ones are probably bigger than other ones to know which ones to put more emphasis on. The, the number doesn't matter so much. Yep. All right, thanks everybody for joining us in this webinar. Uh, we love you guys. We're rooting for you every day and we're doing everything we can to help you to be successful. Uh, we know it's important to you, your families, uh, and your business. And so best of luck to you all and we'll see you in the community.